erase everything you know or everything you think you know about heaven. Start over. Wipe your imagination clean. Forget touched by an angel. <laughs> forget pop culture. Forget poetry. Um, forget Barnes and Noble bestsellers. Wipe your imagination clean. And looking at God's word, we right now are a blank canvas. And our goal, our purpose, is to let God, by his word and by his spirit, speak to us right here and right now and teach us what is biblical, what is correct, what is true about heaven. Why? Because I would argue most of our thinking about heaven is wrong. Most of how we think in kind of modern, popular culture and society, including Christians, most of how we think of heaven, I would argue, is unbiblical and incorrect. Most of our thinking is more Buddhist, more Hindu, more Gnostic, more Platonian than biblical. Most of our thinking is more based kind of on ambiguous poetry and cliches than on raw, concrete, biblical truth. Um, and I don't know about you, but I remember growing up hearing about heaven and I remember between you and me and nobody else but the podcast, um, I remember feeling guilty because to be honest, heaven sounded boring. I mean, in my mind, growing up, heaven was some kind of place up in the sky, somewhere out there, right? Heaven was spiritual, not physical, not tangible. And I was floating in the clouds somewhere, disembodied spirits everywhere. But at the same time, people kind of looked like they were wearing white bathrobes and others cupid-like loincloths and, you know, people are playing harps and Yanni is leading worship. And um, for whatever reason, everybody is Caucasian. I don't know why. And I mean, in my, in my mind, I mean, I would think, really? I mean, is that heaven? Is that what the Bible says? I mean, I mean, really? And I remember hearing the hymn, Amazing Grace, which I love. Uh, and hearing when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, speaking of heaven, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. I remember feeling guilty. I'm like, that's a lot of singing. <laughs> 10,000 years. I mean, I love music, but I don't like singing. I mean, maybe for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but for 10,000 freaking years, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I remember feeling guilty, like, yes, being with Jesus, awesome, but clouds and yawning and harps and singing for eternity is, I mean, really kind of weird, I, I think. And, and um, I would argue, I remember feeling guilty, like, what's wrong with me? Something, am I unspiritual? What's wrong with me? In reality, nothing was wrong with me, but something was wrong with my theology. I did not understand what the scriptures teach. I did not understand the truth about what heaven is and what heaven is not. And right now I'm on the edge of my seat, ready to unpack with you guys from God's word, what heaven is and what heaven is not. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Genesis chapter one, read with me verse one. In the beginning, God created the what? heavens and the earth. Now pause right here. Let me clarify something muy importante that's going to help us understand what? What? Stop laughing at me, you jerks, man alive. Let me clarify something important for you. Oh, because I stopped. Yeah, whatever. Okay, get used to it. This Bible study is going to be like eight hours long, I forewarn you. Um, let me clarify something muy importante. What? Very important, you guys don't speak Spanish? It's funny? Every, you think it's funny, all right, shut up. Let's get back to work. Uh, something very important, you boring suburban people, okay. Um, when you read the word heaven in the Bible, the word is kind of dangerous because the word heaven means different things to different people, would you agree? Not only that, the word heaven means different things in the Bible. Um, the Hebrew word means atmosphere or space. The Greek word used later on in the, by the New Testament authors means sky or universe. And sometimes the first meaning when you read the word heaven in the Bible is universe. And those of you with your handout, pull out your handout right now and take notes on your white sheet of paper. The first meaning, sometimes when you read the word heaven in the Bible, the word means universe, outer space, like in Genesis chapter one, verse one, which is muy importante. 
um, which also means very important. We read God created the heavens. Now by heavens, the text means space. The sun, the moon, the stars, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, Pluto, Orion, the Milky Way, our galaxy. But sometimes when you read the word heaven in the Bible, the word means God's dwelling place. Everybody out loud say heaven is God's dwelling place. Now, later on, the biblical authors would use the same Hebrew word and later on the same Greek word to mean God's dwelling place. Why? Because kind of like how heaven, outer space, the oxygen, the air, the sky is on one hand out of our reach and far away, but on the other hand, all around us, enveloping us, the same is true with our massive, huge, omnipresent God. On one hand, he is far away and he is omnipresent and he is huge but at the same time, he is all around us. Now keep in mind when the biblical authors use the word heaven, meaning God's dwelling place, they are not thinking of some geographic place up in the sky. They are thinking of an omnipresent God who is all around us. Like in Genesis chapter 28, the first time we read the word heaven, meaning God's dwelling place, Jacob is out in the desert and after a vivid a vision right in the middle of the night. He wakes up in a cold sweat and he says, this is Bethel or the house of God. I was, God was right in this place and I did not know it. This is the gate of heaven, he says. Now he's not saying God is some place up in the sky. He's waking up and saying, man, alive, God is all around me everywhere I go. Now, not only that, Sometimes, not only is heaven sometimes universe, sometimes God's dwelling place, but sometimes when you read the word heaven in the Bible, the word means the eternal state. Now by the eternal state, which is a theology word, I mean where we live with God forever. Now most of us, when we say the word heaven, we think of what? The eternal state. Most of us, when we talk about heaven, we think of where we live with God forever, which is a place somewhere with God forever and ever. Now, one of the reasons our theology about heaven is kind of whacked is because the word heaven is in the Bible, meaning three different things, the universe or outer space, God's dwelling place where God is and the eternal state, kind of like language today. When we say somebody's hot, maybe we mean it's 96 degrees outside and maybe we mean you should ask her out. You know what I'm talking about. Same idea, the word heaven means three different things in the Bible. We tracking, making sense? No, let's pretend, nod your head, smile, and let's back to the story. Now, Genesis one goes on. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Verse three, then God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw the light that it was good. Skip down to verse nine, we read, and God saw that it was what? Good, skip down to verse 12, and God saw that it was, everybody? Good, verse 18, God saw that it was good. Verse 24, God said that it was good. We read in Genesis chapter one, the opening story in the Bible about God creating the heavens and the earth, the universe, outer space, mountains, oceans, animals, vegetation, plants, people like you and me, and God says, look at my creation. My creation is good, not bad, good beautiful and perfect. Now we read in Genesis in the story about mankind. Now mankind is kind of God's crowning achievement, his glory, his, the highest in his order of creation. And in the story, and you guys remember some of this from our From Redemption to Recycling series, mankind is living in three perfect life-giving relationships. First, man is living in perfect harmony with his God. We read in chapter three, God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, speaking with Adam and Eve. But not only that, man is living in perfect harmony with one another. We read at the end of chapter two that they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed meaning perfect union, perfect intimacy, no fighting, no anger, perfect joy. Man is living in harmony with his wife, Eve. But not only that, man is living in perfect harmony with the earth. We read the earth is bringing forth food for Adam and Eve to eat. And everything in the opening story of the Bible is flawless. Nothing is out of place. The world is Edenic and perfect. And God looks down from heaven, so to speak, and says it is what? 
Good. Now, this is review. You remember what happens in chapter 3. Skip over to chapter 3. Now, the serpent, which is a Jewish way of saying Satan, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat every tree of the garden? Questioning the Bible or questioning what God's word says. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Remember the story in the center of the Garden of Eden were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, Eve, do not eat. Adam, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So six, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, idiot, and with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves cumbery. Now, you know the story. This is a review. Original sin, Adam and Eve disobey God. Before right here, everything is perfect. Nothing is out of place. But now everything is going to spiral out of control. Look at verse eight. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, what? Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now mankind is out of perfect harmony with the creator. Skip down to verse 11. God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, smart dude, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Now notice God's response. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? He does not argue with Adam. It's like, you're right. No, I'm joking. Relax. Um, <laughs> But the point is now, now Adam is blaming, Eve is blaming Adam and people are blaming one another and bickering and fighting back and forth. And now mankind's perfect relationship with one another, Adam and Eve is broken. But not only that, skip down to verse 17. God says, cursed is the ground for your sake and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Dun, 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 right there in the story. Now mankind's relationship with the earth is broken. Toil and sweat and labor and weeding and mowing the stupid lawn for the eight billionth time. Now mankind's relationship with God, broken. Relationship with one another, broken. And relationship with the earth, broken. Now the entire cosmos, every square inch of creation, men and women, humanity, animals, plants, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, every square inch is out of whack no longer in rhythm, no longer in sync with the creator of the universe. Now everything and everyone is bent and warped and crooked and broken and the result is sin and evil and injustice and poverty and war and murder and lust and depravity and rape and pedophilia and greed and corruption and Bernie Madoff and Iraq and Afghanistan and Blah! The world we inhabit right now, our world is broken, would you agree? Now, don't get me wrong, I love our world. And everywhere we go are echoes of Eden and echoes of our creator. Every, but at the same time, something is bent out of shape in our world. Something is upside down in the world we inhabit and call home. Now, the question becomes, what is God going to do? How, how is he going to rescue his creation? How is he going to rescue the sun and the moon and creation and animals and people? He made the world good long, long ago. Now, how is he going to rescue? Now, the entire biblical narrative from Genesis chapter 3 through Revelation chapter 20, the entire Bible story is about one concept, redemption. The word redeem means to buy back or redeem or restore or renew. The entire Bible is the story not of mankind who is after God, but of a God who is after his people. Of a God who is reaching down from heaven, so to speak, to rescue and redeem and restore his people, which makes us think, okay, what is the future of our world? 
What is the future of our broken planet? What, what is the future of the world God, wait, God made good, but is now broken? Now, there are two ideas. One is wrong and one is right. The wrong idea is the kind of more popular, modern way of thinking about the world, life, death, and heaven. It's the end of the world as we what? We know it. Which means kind of the popular idea is, listen, the world is bad, messed up, broken, horrible, turn on your TV, bad news. One day, Jesus is going to come back to the earth, he's gonna destroy our horrible world, and he's gonna take us to heaven where we die and we live with Jesus forever. Which I would argue is half true and half unbiblical heresy. The biblical idea of God's heart, what God's going to do with his creation is way more fun. Here's the deal, you guys ready? No? Yes, okay. If you're taking notes, the biblical authors would not think like us, world, bad, Jesus comes back, heaven, hell, world goes away. The biblical authors would think in different language. The biblical authors use interesting language to talk about the future of our world. They would break human history and break kind of the timeline of our existence as humans on this planet into two ages, this age and the age to come. If you are taking notes, write this down. This age and the age to come age to come. Now you read this language in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus uses this language. Paul uses this language. Peter uses this language. Now, what is this age? This age is where we live right now. The world we inhabit right now. This age is marked by three things, sin, evil, and death. Sin, when we disobey God, leading to evil, Poverty, injustice, war, regret, sorrow, leading to death, physical, emotional, spiritual, cultural death, which is the end of sin. Now the age to come is where we live forever with God, is our future and the future of our planet. More on that later. Now the early biblical authors and the late biblical authors would divide human history into this age and the age to come and would break the two ages with something called the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh. Now whenever you read about the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh in the Bible, don't think of like a 24 hour Jack Bauer, you know, day to end all days though I love Jack Bauer, but back to the story. Um, think of a period of time when multiple cataclysmic, apocalyptic things happen on our planet. The three main things are number one, Messiah, if you are taking notes. Number two, resurrection. And number three, judgment and reward, meaning what? Meaning at the day of the Lord, the biblical authors believed three things would happen. One, at the end of this age, the world we inhabit, the Messiah would come. The Messiah would come crashing into earth. He's, he's God's savior from heaven. We now know as Jesus. To the late biblical authors and people like us, we know Jesus as coming two times. Once as a suffering servant to die on the cross for our sins. And again, later in the future, as a conquering king to bring heaven crashing into earth and save us forever. But both of us are waiting for the Messiah, waiting for Jesus. Now, when the Messiah would come, the next thing that happens, according to what the Bible says and the biblical authors believed, is something called the resurrection. When the Messiah comes back, when Jesus comes back, he will resurrect the dead, billions of people from all over the world and down through history to live again. Resurrection means bodily resurrection, your body coming back to life after you die, the Messiah will resurrect all men and all women from all over the world back to life. And then the next thing that happens is judgment and reward. Meaning then the Messiah will judge those who are wicked and reward those who are righteous. Now this kind of day of the Lord or day of Yahweh, this kind of cataclysmic coming of the Messiah to the earth would usher in the age to come. Am I making sense here? Now, this is somewhat foreign language to how we talk about the future in heaven right now. Now, here is what you have to understand. Pay attention. Look at me. If I'm over your head, stay with me and come back Sunday for the same message. Stay with me. Here's what you have to understand. Heaven, the eternal state, definition number three, and the age to come are the same idea. 
synonymous terms. When you read about heaven, when you read about the eternal state, and when you read about the age to come, you are reading the same idea. Not only that, but whenever you read about new creation in the Bible, which is new heavens, new earth, and new Jerusalem, more on that later, or whenever you read about eternal life, or whenever you read about the renewal of all things, which is a phrase used in the New Testament, the renewal of all things, you are reading about the same idea, interchangeable, synonymous language. Heaven, the eternal state, the age to come, eternal life, new creation, renewal of all things, same biblical idea. Am I making sense? No? Yes, anybody? Somewhat, maybe, kind of, yes? Okay, here we go. Now the question becomes, what is the age to come like? Or what is heaven like? Or what is eternal life like? Or what is the eternal state where we live with God forever like? If most of our thinking is not biblical, if most of our kind of popular cultural thinking about heaven is wrong, what is right? What does the Bible say? Now let's walk through the Bible and read what the biblical authors teach about the theology of heaven. You guys ready? Turn to Job in your Bibles, to the right in your Bibles. Let's read Job. Job chapter... 19. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. He wrote his play or his language thousands and thousands of years ago. And we read with Job, the first man we know of, the first biblical author, speaking about death and the afterlife and eternity with God. Job is right before Psalms also known as Job, for those of you new to the Bible. <laughs> Job chapter 19, verse 25. Skip down to verse 25. You guys with me? Here we go. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer, or Jesus, or God, lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. God is alive. He's not dead. And after 26, my skin is destroyed, meaning after I die, this I know that in my flesh I shall, what? See God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job, thousands and thousands of years ago, speaking of his death, which was right around the corner, is saying, my heart yearns within me to die and go be with the Lord in the afterlife, the eternal state, heaven, whatever language you employ, to go and be with the Lord. Now notice some interesting things from Job's language about what heaven or about what the afterlife is like. Look first at verse 25. It says, I know my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last, where? Where? On the earth. Okay, interesting meaning the age to come is number one, if you are taking notes, on earth. Not some place up in the sky, not floating clouds, but some place on earth. Interesting, 26, he goes on to say, after my skin is destroyed, in my flesh I shall see God. Meaning in my body, in my human flesh and blood, I shall see God. Meaning interesting, the age to come, we are in a body. Not disembodied spirits way up in the clouds, but in my flesh, he says, number three, see God. Not clouds and harps and mist, but I, he says, am going to see God face to face. Let's keep going, turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60 to the right in your Bible. You guys with me? Three of you. Us and the Trinity, let's go. <laughs> I know God is down with my Bible study. I don't know about you guys. Isaiah chapter 60, the end of his prophecy, Isaiah is speaking of heaven. Now notice what he says about heaven. What he says is different than what I think of as heaven. Chapter 60, verse 19, skip down to the end. Isaiah says, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. 
Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. Meaning in the age to come, in heaven we read about light. But look at verse 21. Also your people shall all be what? Righteous. Meaning not like the 80s word, righteous, but like no sin. Your people shall be righteous, no more sin, no more people being tool sheds like us on a regular basis. But in the age to come, in heaven, your people shall all be righteous. They shall inherit, verse 21 says, the land. Okay, in the age to come, there's land. And they shall inherit the land, he goes on to say, how long? Forever meaning the age to come forever, however you spell forever, is eternal forever and ever and ever ongoing. Turn the page, Isaiah chapter 65, three, four pages to the right. Let's keep going. Now he goes on and again in chapter 65, he is speaking of heaven. He is speaking of the age to come where we live with God forever. Look at verse 17, Isaiah 65, skip down to verse 17. He says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad, rejoice forever in what I create. For I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people as a joy. Okay, in the age to come, we read about new creation, which is a new heavens or a new atmosphere and a new earth or a new planet and a new Jerusalem. Okay, in the age to come, there is a city. But not only that, he goes on to say, I will rejoice in Jerusalem, joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying, meaning God is throwing a party and everyone is invited. No harps, I think God is down with rock and roll. Back to the story. Verse 20, he goes on to say, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. What in the world does he mean? He's talking about heaven. Now, um, verse 20 is kind of hard to understand, to be honest, and scholars think one of two things is going on. Either he's using hyperbole to make a point we live for a long, long time, or he is blending prophecy about something called the millennium, whole nother teaching for like 20 years from now, and heaven into one text right here. Doesn't matter, back to the story. 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. Okay, they shall build, so in heaven there's work and in heaven there's houses. He goes on to say, they shall um, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. There's farming, for those of you from Forest Grove, and <laughs> by the grace of God, there's food. I don't know about you, but I'm pumped about food in heaven. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat, for as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people trees live a long time. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Skip down to verse 24. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Meaning perfect communion, if you are taking notes, with God. The wolf and the lamb, 25. Okay, there are animals in heaven. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion, those of you who have never seen a lion up close, your day is coming. She'll eat straw like the ox and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, which is a way of saying there is peace in the age to come. You guys ready to go there yet? Let's keep going. Turn to Daniel. Stay with me. Daniel to the right, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, four books to the right, skip to the end, chapter 12. You're picking up how different what the Bible says about heaven is than how most of us think. Daniel chapter 12, verse one. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who's an angel, who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now he's talking about the day of the Lord, cataclysmic kind of language. At that time, your people shall be delivered, 
and everyone who is found written in the book or the Lamb's book of life, more on that later, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, like Adam, dead long ago, shall arise, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now he's talking about the day of the Lord and Messiah, the next thing that happens is what? Resurrection, right? But now Daniel is pointing out something, I don't know about you, but I don't like. He's saying not everybody is there, meaning some people rise to eternal life and some people rise to eternal death. Not everybody is on the new earth. Not everybody is in the age to come. Some people rise to eternal shame. But I have good news for you. His name is Jesus. Turn to John chapter 14. To the right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 14. And you guys know John 14. Jesus says in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled when you hear, all right, some rise to eternal life, others rise to eternal death, some in the age to come with God forever, others away from him, eternal shame and contempt, Daniel the prophet says. Don't let your heart be troubled. Look at chapter 14, verse one. Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is inviting all men and all women from all over the world, from down through time to believe in him to believe he was more than a Jewish rabbi, more than an interesting uh, Zen-like philosopher, but to believe he was God in human form, saving humanity. He goes on to say, speaking of heaven in verse two, in my father's house, way of saying heaven, are many mansions. Now mansions is a horrible translation for those of you with the New King James Bible. The word is mone in the Greek, um, which is why most Bibles say dwelling places or rooms. Most Bibles say in my father's house are many rooms. In my father's house are many mansions makes no sense at all and is horrible. In my father's Father's house are many rooms, which means what? Which means don't think you have some mansion somewhere up in heaven. And yours is mine's like four stories tall and whatever. Bad, horrible theology. Whenever you read a book and they're like, I was at my mansion. Nope, you are lying. You are wrong. Um, and you need to study your Bible. In my father's house, my father's dwelling place are many rooms, many monae. Now, I think Jesus is speaking of the new Jerusalem, but more on that later. And Jesus goes on to say, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said to him, I, verse six, am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through me. Now, let's keep going. Jesus says, speaking of heaven, speaking of the age to come, one, it's a place. It's not a state of being or some ethereal spiritual concept, but a real tangible place. But not only that, Jesus says, I am the way there. If you want to be with God, if you want to be with the Father, if you want to invest eternity in God's presence, Jesus says, believe in me. He is inviting people wherever you are from, whatever your background is, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your faith, Jesus is inviting you to believe in him that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again because he is the one and only way to heaven, to God's dwelling place, to know the living God. He is the way for people like us, which is why Peter goes on to say, turn to Acts chapter three, to the right, John, Acts, the next book is Acts, turn the pages, Acts chapter three, which is why Peter goes on to say in Acts chapter three, he's preaching the gospel to the city of Jerusalem, verse 19, skip down to the middle. Peter says, repent therefore and be converted. Repent means stop, turn around, stop doing what you're doing and now follow Jesus, that your sins may be blotted out because like humanity, every one of us is broken, sinful is biblical language. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord or heaven, that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive now notice he's not talking about us going to heaven when we die, he's talking about Jesus Christ coming back from heaven, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration or the renewal, the NIV says, of 
all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Peter says, everybody repent, believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and make your way to be with God forever because the renewal of all things is coming. Notice his language. Do you know that all things means what? All things. Wait a minute, are you serious? Yes. Meaning Peter is saying the renewal of all things is not just about humans. The renewal of all things is also about the entire universe. Turn to Romans chapter eight. I'm almost done, stay with me. Romans chapter eight to the right in your Bible. And now Paul, years later, is talking about the renewal of all things, talking about heaven and the future. Skip down to Romans chapter eight, verse 18. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this age and our broken world are not worthy to be compared with heaven. 419, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, the what? Whole creation, wake up people, groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What Paul says in Romans eight is all things, the whole creation in the age to come is waiting, hoping for heaven, for the renewal of all things, for the age to come, for the heavens and the earth, meaning heaven is not just for humans. Heaven is for animals and plants and rocks and trees and oceans and rivers and mountains and stars and supernovas and Mars and the moon. I mean, heaven is for the entire cosmos and every blade of grass, every leaf on every tree, every rock, every man, every woman, all of us in different ways is looking forward hoping for the return of Christ, which could be any day, any moment, right around the corner. We are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. I'm making sense. Now, before we read about the new heavens and the new earth, I think the question for most of us, I know you guys are smart people, I know what you're thinking right now, some of you, becomes, all right, where do we go right now when we die? If someday new creation is coming, and someday God is going to return to the earth, the day of the Lord, Messiah, resurrection, judgment of the wicked, reward of the righteous. God is gonna set up his kingdom on earth. The world is going to be made new. What about right now? When we die right now, where do people go? Anybody thinking about that right now? Because you don't go to the new earth, it's not there yet. You don't go to the future, we're not there yet. Where do people go right now? Now here is where people get confused about heaven. The next five minutes are gonna be very dense. But if you stay with me, three of you are gonna stay awake and this is gonna make sense, okay? You guys ready? All right, turn your hand out over. In the beginning, here we go. Right now, let's use me as an example because what the heck, I'm up here. We have life. I am alive, not dead, by the grace of God. JMC, John Mark Comer, here I am. I'm riding my motorcycle, my helmet. Motorcycle, woo, yay, life is awesome. Okay, I'm riding my motorcycle. What happens after life? Death, you are smart people. Next comes death. Here's a Mack truck. <laughs> Head on collision, splat. Okay, I die, you weep, you cry. My wife has life insurance, everybody gets over it. Um, <laughs> Now next, what happens next? Where do we go? If new heavens, new earth is in the future, if new creation is in the future, where do we go right now when we die? Short answer, heaven. But let me explain something to you. We go to a place in theology, I'm gonna sound super nerdy right now, called the intermediate state. Everybody say the intermediate state. 
you can't even say the word, good grief. The intermediate state, which is where we go right now when we die, which sounds kind of Catholic slash Star Trek, but bear with me, is historic orthodox theology. What is the intermediate state? What is wrong with you, Comer? Stay with me. The intermediate state is when your spirit goes to heaven and your body goes into the ground. Now keep in mind, we are not a spirit stuck in a body. As human beings, we are spiritual and physical. We are material and immaterial. But when we die, our body, our being, who we are, is divided into two parts. Your body, as you know, goes into the ground. You die, you are with the worms and the compost. Your spirit goes to heaven with God. Your spirit is in heaven with Jesus. Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I Meaning the moment you die, you are not rotting in some grave somewhere. Your body, yes, is underneath the ground, but your spirit is alive to the presence of God. You wake up the moment you close your eyes to this broken but beautiful planet. You open your eyes to the face of God. Now, scholars debate in the intermediate state, are we disembodied spirits? And some people think we are. Most scholars think we live in some kind of a temporary body based on the Bible and the book of Revelation. More on that, like, 30 years from now, I don't know when. But either way, the point is, during the intermediate state, when we die, you are in heaven with God, but you are separated from your body. Am I making sense? Now, what happens next is the day of the Lord. Remember the day of Yahweh. What's the second part of the day of the Lord? Resurrection. Now, resurrection does not mean you die and your spirit is floating up to heaven, okay? Resurrection always, every time in language, in theology, in the Bible, always means your body coming back to life. What happens at the day of the Lord, at resurrection, is your body comes up from the ground and your spirit comes down, so to speak, from heaven and you are reunited, your spirit and your body are reunited back together again and you live in a glorified body. Which means you have hair, I have a beard in heaven. I can't grow one here. <laughs> My feet are smaller. And I look a lot like Matt Norman, big muscles. I am awesome, yay. <laughs> Glorified body, more on that next week with Randy. What happens next? Next, we live forever on the new earth. We're tracking. Now here is what is confusing. Do you know what this is called? The intermediate state? This is called heaven. Do you know what this is called? Life forever on the new earth in a glorified body. Guess what this is called? Heaven, which is why people are thinking, what in the world are you talking about? Both are called heaven. Now here's the difference. This, for sake of argument, for our sake, let's call this one present heaven, where we go right now when we die. And let's call this one future heaven. Now here's the problem. Most of our language, most of our thinking today, most of our poetry, most of our music is about which one? Present heaven. Most of our thinking about heaven, most of our language is about disembodied spirits. You die, your body's in the ground, you are somewhere up in the sky with Jesus, which may or may not be true. The Bible, to be honest, is ambiguous about what the intermediate state is like. Most of the Bible's language most of the biblical authors talk is about future heaven, about new creation, about the age to come, about new heavens and new, forever, new earth and living with God forever. Am I making sense? No. Now let's read about what the new creation, about what future heaven is like. Now we are ready. I hope I have laid the groundwork for you from all over the Bible. If not, I wasted 44 minutes of your time. But I hope I have laid the groundwork for you to understand the difference between present heaven and future heaven, which I know sounds kind of Star Trek, but is biblical truth, I promise you. And don't take my word, you go study in your own time. Now let's read about what heaven, and by heaven I mean future heaven, is like. You guys ready? Turn to Revelation chapter 21. 
Now let's read what God's word says. Done with my whiteboard, ready for the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, look at verse one. John, who's writing the book, receiving some vision from Jesus, says, chapter 21, verse one, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now my new, don't think like he throws the old one away like a piece of garbage. The word is kainos in the Greek, which means new like renewed. Paul uses the same language in 2 Corinthians when he says, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. One day, God is going to make our world new. Now, some people think heaven right here means the universe. Others think heaven right here means God's dwelling place. We don't know for sure. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The word first in the Greek is the word proto, where we get the word prototype, meaning this earth, this world, as we know our world, is the prototype of what's coming. All around you, every time you walk out the door, hints of heaven. People who say, you will never know what heaven is like are dead wrong. The Bible gives us tons of hints about what heaven is like. And our planet, creation all around us, gives us tons of hints of what heaven is like. Picture our beautiful planet new. Ours is the prototype. Ours is the sneak peek of coming attractions, so to speak. But a new and better and whole and good one is coming. He goes on to say, also there was no more sea. Interesting, why? Because to the ancient Jews, the sea was symbolic of death and evil and anarchy. The Jews were scared to death of the sea. He says, in heaven, there is no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John looks up and there's a city. Now, everybody agrees some of the language at the end of the Bible is symbolic. But most scholars, most teachers think most of what we are reading is literal. When John says, I see a city, he means, I see a what? A city. When he means, says, I see new Jerusalem, he means, I see new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, which means what? Which means at the end of the Bible, you don't read about God throwing away the earth and taking us to heaven where we live in some weird place up in the sky. No, you read about God making the earth new once again and God bringing heaven, bringing the new Jerusalem back down to earth and read what the city is like, what heaven is like. Verse three, we read, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them. Now heaven is on earth. If you are taking notes, write this down. Bon Jovi was right. Heaven is a place on earth. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, I make all things what? New, I renew all things, all of my creation, all of my people. I renew, I make all things new. Now we read mankind is back in perfect harmony with his God, back like in the garden of Eden. Now mankind is back living in perfect communion with God. He is dwelling on the earth. We are with God forever. Let's read about what heaven is like. Look at verse six. He said to me, it is done, right? Our waiting is over. Now the age to come is here. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. We think he means the Holy Spirit meaning no more God in measured doses, so to speak. But now we are enveloped and lost in God's presence. He, verse seven, who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, he shall be my son, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He's not letting us lose sight of what the Bible says. Heaven is real and hell is real. Some rise to eternal life. Others who reject Jesus and do not believe in Jesus and do not trust Jesus 
for the forgiveness of sins rise to eternal damnation. Then look at verse nine. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me, talked with me, said, come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. This angel says to John, hey, look, come on, let's go, let's look and let's read and let's see what the new Jerusalem was like. Look at verse 12. She had a great and high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three on the east, three on the north, south and the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. On them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Meaning the 12 gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament. And the 12 foundations are named after the 12 apostles from the New Testament, which means what? Which is, we think, a symbolic way of saying in the New Jerusalem, God's naming part of the city after people who lived long ago and part of the city after the church and believers after Jesus, saying now mankind is back in perfect harmony with one another. Jews from long ago in the church and people, Jews and Gentiles and black and white and male and female and people from all over the world are together back in perfect harmony in God's city. Now the city is ginormous. Look at verse 15. He who talked with me had a gold reed, which is kind of an ancient measuring tape, to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, the measuring tape, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Now, for those of you thinking, who cares? You care. Listen to this. 12,000 furlongs is 1,400 miles. He says, listen, the New Jerusalem is 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles long, and 1,400 miles high. Do you know how big that is? That's 40 times the country of England, 15,000 times the city of London. If you put the New Jerusalem, which we think is a real, literal, flesh and blood city, right in the middle of the United States of America, the city would stretch from Mexico to Canada and from California to the East Coast on the ground floor. But not only that, the city is 1,400 miles high. Now, some people think there are skyscrapers 1,400 miles high, which is awesome. Others think the city is more like a cube or like a pyramid with levels. Now, if that's true, the square footage of the city is insane. You could put, somebody did the math, you could put the 7 billion people on the planet in the city of New Jerusalem, and everybody would have four to five square miles to themselves. <laughs> we are talking about a giant, huge, massive city. But not only that, the city is beautiful. Look at verse 17. Um, then he measured its wall, 140 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is of an angel. The construction of its wall around the city was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Those of you like myself who like modern architecture, walls of glass in the New Jerusalem. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third and fourth goes on and on. Skip down to verse 21. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Now he's not saying like, look, the streets are paved with gold. He's saying gold, are you kidding me? They paved the streets with gold in heaven. The most precious metals of our earth right now are the concrete and steel and dirt and asphalt of the New Jerusalem. The most precious metal our world has to offer, the most beautiful things about our planet right now we can imagine are the most base and fundamental objects of the New Jerusalem and the coming heavens and earth. Meaning we can get hints, we can get glimpses when we look out at a beautiful day of what heaven is going to be like, what the age is to come is going to be like, but they are no more than hints glimpses of what the city is going to be like. Now, the best part about the city is not how big the city is or how beautiful the city is, but the reality that right in the center of the city is God himself. Look at verse 22. He says, but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are 
its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon, meaning there is a sun and there is a moon, but we don't need you guys anymore. For the glory of God illuminated it. The lamb or Jesus is the light. Right in the center of the city is Jesus Christ, the son of God, God himself, like light emanating throughout the entire city. No need for lights. No, the entire eternal perfect light. God is right in the heart of the city. We are with God forever. He goes on to say in verse 24, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. Are you saying there are nations in heaven? Yep. And the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into the city. Are you saying there are kings in heaven? Yep. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day because there's nothing to fear. There's no crime. There's no nothing. There shall be no night there. Picture San Diego weather, 24 hours a day, all year long. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, only those who are saved by Christ's death on the cross, by faith in Jesus. Now look at chapter 22, we're almost done. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the lamb. Interesting, because remember in the garden of Eden, we read about rivers. Look at verse two. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. Interesting, because remember, we read about the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And verse three, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Interesting, because remember, we read about no curse in the story of Genesis. The author of Revelation is drawing a direct, bold, blatant parallel between the Garden of Eden and the New Jerusalem. He's saying the first two chapters of the Bible are about the Garden of Eden, about the creation of the world. The last two chapters of the Bible are about the recreation of the world. In the Garden of Eden, we read about rivers. In the New Jerusalem, there's a river running through the center of the city. The Garden of Eden, we read about the tree of life right in the center of the garden. In the New Jerusalem, there's a forest of the tree of life on both sides of the river. The Garden of Eden, we read about gold in Genesis chapter two. In the New Jerusalem, the streets are paved with gold. In the Garden of Eden, we read about precious stones in the Genesis story and in Ezekiel's prophecy. In the New Jerusalem, those same precious stones are the foundations of the city. The Garden of Eden, we read about mankind with God and no curse. In the New Jerusalem, we read about mankind back with God and no more curse. He's saying heaven is the new Eden. Human history begins in a garden and ends, or should I say begins a second time, in a garden-like city. The Bible is the story of the movement from humans from a garden by the grace of Jesus Christ redeeming his people back to a garden-like city, which is why he goes on to say in verse six, these words are faithful and true. Two times at the beginning of his teaching about heaven and at the end, he says like bookends, these words are faithful and true. I know it sounds too good to be true, but it's not, it's real, it's not fantastic myth, it's reality. And the Lord God of his holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants, people like us, the things which must shortly take place. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly. I don't know about you, but I love Jesus, the Bible, and where we are going with him forever. Now notice when you read about heaven in the book of Revelation, notice what's not there. Clouds, harps, disembodied spirits, Cupid loincloths, uh, I don't think Yanni is leading worship. Nobody is floating around in the sky. You read about God's people, those saved, stay with me, those saved by Christ's death on the cross, by faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the savior of humanity from heaven to earth to redeem and rescue his broken planet. You read about his people, those saved by Jesus, living in a new city, in a new Jerusalem, 
on a new planet and a new universe in God's presence. I don't know about you, but when I think about heaven, I don't think of floating in the clouds anymore. Now I think about my favorite places on earth. I think of Yosemite, I think of Hawaii, I think of the Alps, I think of the Oregon coast. I, I, I think of my favorite cities on the planet, London and New York and Paris and Portland, Oregon. Uh, but I think of my favorite cities with no crime, no pollution, no traffic, no noise, no graffiti, no fixed gear bicycles running into semi trucks anymore. I think of my city brand new. I, I think of things I love to do, of, of swimming, of going on a walk, of going out on the boat, of spending time with family and friends, of drinking coffee, of eating good food, of sleeping in in the morning, of enjoying my beautiful planet. I, I mean, I think of the people I love, my family and my friends, but most of all, I think of my God and being with my God forever, face to face. Not God in some kind of vague, ambiguous way, but God right here. Where does God live? He's right downstairs. I'm on the eight billionth level, but he's, he's downstairs. I'm with God, face to face, speaking with Jesus and his prophets and men and women of God who go before us, David and Paul and Peter and John the Baptist and Abraham and Moses and Adam. Adam, what were you thinking? And Eve and whatever. They let you in, are you serious? God is gracious. I think of being with people I love and being in my God's presence forever and ever and ever and ever. And most of all, to be honest, I think what we read about in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 is not the end of the story. I think it's the beginning. Now, before we go, let's wrap up with some questions. Um, I think one, we should ask ourselves, where will we be 10 million years from tonight? Will you be with God forever on the new heavens and the new earth in the new Jerusalem, which is not myth, not fantastic, weird thinking, but is true. These words are faithful and true. What I'm saying, he says, is reality. Will you be with God forever? When you are resurrected, when your spirit is reunited with your body at the day of the Lord and at the resurrection, will you rise to eternal life with God or to eternal death away from God? The choice is yours. All you have to do is repent of your sins and trust Jesus for salvation. Believe, Jesus is inviting you to believe. There's a prayer room to my right, your left. Nothing weird is going on back there. Nobody's gonna freak out on you, but people would love to speak with you about Jesus. You'd like to repent of your sin and pray and ask God to invade your life and take over your life in the future and right here, in heaven and right now, in this age on the earth. We would love to pray with you. But I think for those of us who are saved, who know the living God, who know Jesus, I think we should ask ourselves, are we living in hope? I mean, are we? Are we remembering where we are going, what our home is, where we are going to live forever and ever with our God? Remember what Paul says, and back in Romans 8, we read like an hour ago. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In whatever trials, whatever tribulations, whatever suffering you are going through right now, even if it's horrible, even if it's hard, even if it's crushing, Paul, who was a man who knew pain well and knew suffering well and knew fear well, Paul says, our suffering right now is not even worthy to be compared with our glory in the future, with knowing God forever and ever. Whatever you are going through, May your eyes be on the new heavens and on the new earth, but most of all, may your eyes be on your God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.